To address this conference is always an honour. To do so as Defence Secretary is a privilege. The first duty of government is to keep Britain safe. As a party, we can be proud that not only have we tackled the biggest peacetime deficit, but that we've also sorted out the defence budget. That's because we have a Prime Minister who puts defence at the top of his priorities, and a Chancellor who understands that strong defence depends upon a strong economy. Four years on, we have the biggest defence budget in Europe and the second largest in NATO. It is thanks to my predecessors, Liam Fox and Philip Hammond, that defence is now on a secure footing so that we can invest again in the Royal Navy, in the Army and the Royal Air Force. We have the best and bravest armed forces, working 24-7 across the world to protect us, often out of sight, but never out of mind. My very first week, I sent HMS Enterprise to Tripoli to rescue British citizens from war-torn Libya. In Cyprus, I met airmen and women who were airlifting humanitarian support to people in Iraq. And here at home, the armed forces are defending our skies, helping with the floods, and supporting the inspiring Invictus Games. Our military embody the very best of British values. Selflessness, courage, discipline, and respect. And nowhere have those values been better demonstrated than in Afghanistan, where our troops have risked their lives to stop that country becoming a safe haven for terrorism. By the end of this year, we will bring our combat troops home. So it's right now for us to pay tribute to the sacrifice of the 453 British servicemen and women who gave their lives and to the many who were injured. But let us remember their legacy. A 350,000 strong Afghan security force that we've helped to train. Eight million people voting in elections this summer. Seven million children now attending schools. Nearly three million of them girls. There can be no guarantees, but we can be proud of having helped to give Afghanistan the best possible chance of a stable future. Now we face new threats to our security. The chilling barbarity of ISIL, if left unchecked, would see a terrorist state on Europe's doorstep. Now we've already seen Islamic extremism here at home. London commuters blown up, Glasgow airport attacked, Fusilier Lee Rigby murdered, and abroad, Christians, Yazidis, and other faiths slaughtered, a British hostage beheaded. No responsible government could ignore this challenge. So we've joined our international allies, including other Arab states, in tackling ISIL in Iraq. Our planes have been flying daily following Parliament's vote, gathering intelligence, and yesterday striking in support of Kurdish ground forces. And I can confirm there were further such strikes early this morning. We didn't choose this fight, but for the security of our nation, we must respond. And alongside Islamic extremism, Putin's illegal annexation of Crimea and his troops in eastern Ukraine remind us of how dangerous this world is. It is thanks to the defense review that we conducted that we have a long-term plan to keep Britain safe. And I have a strong ministerial team to deliver it. Mark Francois, Philip Dunn, Anna Soubry, Julian Brazier, and Lord Astor, ably supported by our PPSs, Graham Evans, Andrew Bingham, and Mark Pawsey, and our whip, Mark Lancaster. This is what we're doing. 
First, we are reshaping our armed forces to make them more agile with a military where regulars and reserves serve together. After years of neglect by Labour, we're investing over £2 billion in our reserve forces. It's a great opportunity. You get paid, you learn new skills, you experience adventure. No wonder several hundred young people are now stepping forward each month. Reservists make a tremendous contribution. Each is truly twice a citizen. Now, service as an officer in the old TA used to carry the right to use TD after your name as a recognition of your service. So I want to see a new reserve decoration awarded to all who've served 10 years and awarded irrespective of rank. Second, we're making sure that we have the best military hardware that money can buy. It's because we've sorted out the budget, taken some painful decisions, that over the next 10 years, we are able to spend £164 billion. Pounds. The Navy is getting seven advanced hunter-killer submarines. And today I'm announcing a £3.3 billion pound investment in our naval bases, securing 7,500 jobs in Portsmouth, in Devonport, and on the Clyde. The RAF will have new fleets of fighters, more surveillance aircraft, new transport planes, and for the Army, nearly 600 scout armoured vehicles, the largest Army equipment order for 30 years. <laughs> Thirdly, we're strengthening NATO. Last month's successful NATO summit, hosted by the Prime Minister, regalvanized our transatlantic alliance with a first formal public commitment by all the allies to reverse the decline in defense spending and to establish a rapid reaction force that can deploy anywhere within 48 hours. Putin should be in no doubt that our collective defense is as strong as ever. And let me tell you that despite the deficit we inherited, we are now meeting the 2% defence target. And we will go on spending 2% for the rest of the spending review period. And I want us to continue that commitment. This is no time to drop our guard or to lower our spending. Now, when we discuss defence spending, some question the lower target of 0.7% of GDP on overseas aid. I don't see defence and aid as opposites. Failed states allow the poisonous ideology of Islamic extremism to fester. Our military helped tackle this through conflict prevention and stabilisation. Defence and international aid go together in securing our interests. So we've put defence on a sound footing after 13 years of mismanagement which undermined our ability to defend Britain. Labour left a terrible legacy, a £38 billion black hole, the covenant broken, our reserves neglected, accommodation unfit for our heroes. They ordered two aircraft carriers not even sure whether they could run the second one or whether they'd have to flog it. Now, sorting out the defence budget has been tough, but it's done. The covenant is now protected in law. Our forces helped to buy, has helped over 800 service men and women to buy their first home just since April. And last month, the Prime Minister confirmed that both our aircraft carriers will be brought into service. Uh, 
And we're doing all this, by the way, with 25,000 fewer civil servants. Let me turn... Let me turn to the Liberal Democrats. There aren't any Liberal Democrats in the Defence Ministry. The only area of defence... The only area... The only area of defence the Liberal Democrats seem interested in is downgrading our continuous at sea nuclear deterrent for a part time deterrent sitting in a dockyard. In a dangerous world, that is truly dangerous thinking. <laughs> Conference, this country has always stood firm in the face of threats to our security. This is the country that stood alone to defeat fascism under Churchill, that stood up to communism under Margaret Thatcher. What we're fighting today is a new form of extremism, a perversion of a good religion, Islam. It is Britain, once again, that is defending our values, the rule of law, freedom of speech, religious tolerance, and democracy. And in doing so, we can rely on two enduring strengths, the courage and skill of our armed forces and the determination of the British people to get behind them. So no matter what the threat, let me finally assure you of this. This party, this government, will give our armed forces the backing they need to help keep Britain safe.